Hey everyone, welcome to Office Hours with Cloud Posse, your weekly dose of insider DevOps trends, AWS news, and Terraform insights, all sourced from our Sweet Ops community, plus a live Q&A you can't find anywhere else. It's September 11th, 2024. I'm your host, Eric Osterman. Real quick, I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator that helps funded startups and enterprises conquer AWS. And we do this by leveraging our over 200 Terraform modules. So if you've been frustrated or found your team challenged with adopting Terraform and some of the best practices, do reach out. Just go to cloudposse.com slash meet. Again, cloudposse.com slash meet. Answer a few quick questions and you'll book a meeting with me directly. All right. So how can you maximize today's session? First off, our format is very informal. Uh, you know, interrupt, engage as much as you'd like, ask questions. And if you're curious about any of our open source tools or modules, go for it. And for those on the recording, we host these calls live, so don't miss out. Go to cloudposse.com slash, qu- uh, <laughs> slash office hours, uh, cloudposse.com slash office hours to register. So if you do find any portion of today's office hours valuable, go ahead and share it with your team. Just head over to youtube.com slash cloudposse, and you'll find a recording of this uh, session posted there in a few hours. All right, so without further ado, here are the news and announcements. Let's see here, moving my windows around a little bit. All right, Uh, first one was something that I feel let down. Nobody (laughs) told me about this CLI, and I don't know how it missed my radar. Um, there is, uh, there have been a lot of CLIs for ECS over the years. Uh, a lot of them have been kind of like R and D skunk work projects by Amazon engineers. The one that is, uh, what I thought, uh, leading the race, uh, at least on this was the Amazon co-pilot CLI, the AWS, uh, co-pilot CLI. Now this is not to be confused with the GitHub co-pilot CLI or go GitHub co-pilot service. Uh, the Amazon Copilot is a service for declaratively managing your ECS task deployments with a modern CLI. Well, it, it, in the proverbial confusion that is Amazon um, and, and their services, they have another CLI. This one's called Amazon ECS CLI, kind of maybe like the EKS CTL, uh, EKS Cuddle uh, CLI for EKS. And what's really remarkable about this is that they support the Docker Compose format. Now, if you are familiar with Docker Compose, the uh, the subcommand of Docker, uh, formerly a standalone uh, CLI, it supported Docker Compose for a very long time. And in the past 12 months or so, they deprecated that support and it's no longer there. So that left a hole or a gap uh, in my mind for simple deployments to ECS. And why I was so bummed about that was just when we were ready to re-implement our ECS uh, CD solution with GitHub Actions, we were ready to start using that Docker Compose methodology because I thought that'd be really cool to have something uh, familiar uh, locally for test and development, as well as um, deploying to production or staging, or at the very minimum, deploying preview environments to ECS. Well, that wasn't really possible with Copilot, plus Copilot doesn't support Docker Compose. There, Docker, it, there are GitHub issues for AWS Copilot to support Docker Compose format. My guess is they're not gonna add support if, hey, they have this first class support for it here in this CLI. Um, this repo is not new, <laughs> it's very old. And I'm just really embarrassed uh, that I'm the, you know, 1,801 star on this repository and didn't know about it. And that just goes to show my Googling foo sucks. So uh, anyone using this, kick the tires on it. Uh, have anything else to add? All right. Um, there are many threads in Sweet Ops about, uh, you know, the best way to meld Terraform with like CD, be it GitLab or GitHub Actions. Um, and 
Uh, yeah. So uh, if this is an interesting topic to you, check out the SweetOps Slack. Go to slack.sweetops.com or slack.cloudposse.com. They're the same thing. And uh, you can find those threads there. All right. Next, uh, next announcement. All right. So this one was brought to my attention. Um, I was climbing this weekend and uh, a buddy of mine there, uh, he used to work for Broadcom. He couldn't take it anymore. Uh, he just felt like they were ripping off too many customers. So he switched to Red Hat. Um, but he was, uh, and he's actually working on the side of the house that is uh, probably going to be representing um, Terraform sales and, and so forth. He's, uh, you know, helping sell Tanzu and uh, Ansible and some of those products. Anyways, he brought this to my attention. I had missed it somehow, which is, uh, uh, there's a company, uh, Vertamove, that is another one of these patent troll type companies that seems to now be targeting a lot of the major cloud providers or uh, technology providers who are leveraging open source and that open source is violating supposedly a patent that they hold. They obviously should be going after, <laughs> look, I, we develop a lot of open source. I, I, I don't say this lightly. Uh, I don't want them to be coming after us, but here's the deal. They can go after us all they like. It's not gonna change the reality that they're, you know, they're gonna get a pittance uh, for that compared to suing uh, I, the likes of IBM, HP, Google, and Amazon, of course. So they are suing those companies uh, for the deep pockets that they have uh, for violating pa patents um, violated by them as users of open source. So uh, what IBM, or sorry, yeah, what IBM is trying, or sorry, Red Hat is trying to do here is change the the conversation that users of open source shouldn't be the ones getting sued for violating patents that the open source itself is breaking. Um, any thoughts on this one? Well, a lot of the patent trolls, I'm sure people have seen this, um, are usually, they patent a technology that has already been invented in the past um, and that doesn't seem to matter with our courts, especially in East Texas. I, I wish though, like this type of issue with the patent trolls would become a, a political policy for both parties. <laughs> we push it up there and make it an issue, but probably is dwarfs in comparison, but if this has been plaguing yeah. our industry for years, ever since they changed the laws and stuff like that to make them really hard to defend against these patent trolls. Uh, so you, I don't know. I've I've had a, a lot more uh, positive uh, impression on the movement, but I can't bring up specific cases or so forth. Uh, I guess my news is jaded by all the positive uh, things I've seen come out of Cloudflare attacking um, the patent trolls and being victorious uh, basically every time and suing the patent trolls out of existence. I was bummed not to see uh, Cloudflare as uh, one of the. Uh, people here in the claim it's that yeah no what i'm saying is like the I'm, I'm glad that what cloudflare did and this stuff but um i wish the laws could be changed because there's a change in our laws that opened the floodgates for this at one point i forgot which administration came out of i wish they could be reset back or something you Got know it. um a lot of times what they do is they'll go after not so much the big companies um but they'll go after the middle tier so for example in the xerox one like scanning your document pdf there's a patent troll that sued basically anyone using the xerox machine <laughs> and they could get money out of that because they go for the aggregate of companies that have money but they don't have enough to defend themselves and they're not small ones they're like mid-sized companies yeah yeah something needs to break uh when it relates to these patent trolls it's just uh insane and this and this happens to be about containerization. So my guess is any any uh, major uh, deep pocketed player leveraging Docker, Kubernetes, or similar technology is uh, in the crosshairs. Remember when hyperlinks they were suing for hyperlinks as a patent? No. Oh, hyperlinks. No, I don't remember that one. So they were they um, as Eolus or something was suing Microsoft and and Google and other companies. 
or hyperlinking to something would be an object, a metaphor type concept. Um, the thing is, is before even the web, there was a thing called HyperCard from Apple that had uh -huh. hyperlinks in it. Um, so the technology is, but the courts, of course, they're dumb. They're not technical people. Yeah. The, the, they're like, well, that sounds good. And then, and this was like tens of millions of dollars of lawsuits. Did they win? They actually did. Um, really? but I, I appealed and stuff like that, but it's going back and forth. I don't know what the last result is, but they'd lose and then they'd peel and then they'd win and then it get appealed. So it's like, yeah, it goes back and forth. But, uh, initially Microsoft paid a huge amount of money, um, out on it. So I just, it, I, yeah, I, I can't believe the attorneys that go up against these companies with their pockets and resources. Uh, it's uh, going to take some, uh, you know, illusions of grandeur uh, to to uh, win against this. But hey, I guess... I think there's a settlement. Fun. So they, they paid the troll off at a certain point. So yeah. I'm, I don't know. I'm just looking up now. Yeah. I think containerization is too big to uh, concede on. All right. Next announcement. Um, let's see here. Uh, I don't want to so I sent a link to the one on the Eolis from Ars Technica, um, the conclusion of that one. All right. The next announcement, uh, shifting gears, um, is related to Open Tofu. As you know, Open Tofu, um, when the fork happened, um, I forget the timeline exactly of events, but very shortly after the fork happened, I believe the um, FAQ uh, for the BSL on uh, Terraform was updated or changed that made it against the terms of service by any non-HashiCorp product to use the Terraform registry. And that was a defensive move that immediately made it so Open Tofu couldn't legitimately, any Open Tofu uh, tool or CLI couldn't legitimately access the uh, Terraform registry without breaking the terms of service. So they uh, rapidly pushed out a um, open source registry uh, for all the open source uh, modules and providers out there to maintain compatibility uh, with that, but it was very bare bones, right? It was basically based on uh, flat files inside of a GitHub repository that were pushed to like an S3 bucket somewhere fronted by CloudFront. Uh, it was lacking a registry. So, uh, you know, everyone was kind of using the Terraform registry as a resource to find modules, but they had to use the Terraform registry uh, for downloading. And that is no longer. Now you can uh, go to register search dot open tofu dot org and use uh, the new um, uh, search provided by this. It's under active development, which is a good thing because it seems like the HashiCorp registry has all but stopped in development. Um, a lot of the cloud posse readmes just don't work in the HashiCorp registry. They don't support admonitions yet. Uh, you know, relative links don't work. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, if you use a relative link, it's just going to link to a broken page on the HashiCorp registry. I hope these are some of the things that are going to address in this. It's still, uh, some of those faults are still in the hash, in the uh, Open Tofu registry. Like if I search for EKS here and go to, let me change this position here. So if I go to the EKS cluster module here, um, we see the admonition here is not properly rendered and we have some down below. I wish I remembered where we have uh, relative links here, but I don't know an example right away here. Let's see if this one, yep. Okay, so it has the same problems. I really think that they should just set the base URL of the page to be that of the module. And I think a lot of those relative links will just start working. All right, um, next announcement is one, uh, this was, a, was it, yeah, a week old or so. Uh, you know, 
it's long been understood that Pulumi uh, got its start by basically wrapping Terraform providers and enabling you to call those providers from your language of choice, be it you know TypeScript, uh, Python, Java, et cetera. Uh, what I didn't realize was I thought that support just you know, was basically using the RPC interface of plugins um, so you could call any plugin from Pulumi. Well, I guess that was not the case because with this announcement, they're saying that they now support that, that you can basically use any provider uh, with Pulumi. I have to say for the past uh, you know, couple months, been doing a lot more um, development as we've been updating our documentation using Docusaurus and our forthcoming marketing site using uh, Next.js and React and Tailwind. And just how pleasant that experience is compared to using Terraform. And uh, yeah, feeling some FOMO on uh, the, <laughs> the potential of Pulumi here uh, or, or seeing where it can fit in. Um, you know, we have a huge investment in Terraform and that whole ecosystem. Um, I wonder uh, what the world looks like where these two live together um, with, without a contrived kind of way just to prove that they work together, but a beneficial way of leveraging both. Any thoughts on um, Pulumi? All right, tearing through these announcements. Let's see here. Uh, oh, uh, someone shared, Michael shared uh, an interesting uh, link that the design for Homebrew, sorry, the design for the Terraform registry was uh, inspired initially by Homebrew. Um, also, what's interesting is yeah you know homebrew recently shifted to oci for distributing the artifacts so i wonder um if they're gonna start doing the same in open tofu pretty soon because oci is a much faster way to pull modules than git anything to add to this michael i know you were the one who shared it no not really i just thought it was an interesting read i remember kind of when they put out the initial like request for people to talk about um, like different design ideas. Uh, there were a couple that came up and this was the one that the steering committee went with. So I just thought it was kind of interesting. I like the layout of homebrew. So I thought it was a good, a good choice. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. It's uh yeah. yeah. All right. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm going to read through that a little bit closer. I'm all, I always like uh, getting inspiration from how other open source projects are working. It wasn't on my radar. All right, next announcement is a uh, minor one, just very brief. Uh, you know, as open tofu adoption uh, increases, uh, we see more and more major corporations submitting their public keys. And, you know, what does that mean? Not much, but it's a, you know, it's the sentiment of it is a token, an indicator that they are using it internally in some capacity. So uh, you can see this was submitted by a Microsoft employee, um, a Terraform provider, Azure public key, uh, so that they can maintain their provider with signed uh, um, binaries. So uh, any more announcements? Let's see here. Um, Thanks, Joaquin, for sharing the link earlier on the uh, the patent troll saga with links. It's the internet that almost wasn't. <laughs> I saw this morning that um, Terraform, I believe they released, I think it's 1.10 alpha. Um, introducing a new feature, um, ephemeral values, which basically, oh. yeah, I thought it was, I thought that was really interesting. Um, basically allowing you kind of like similar to sensitive, how you tag it as mm -hmm. sensitive equal to true. You could do ephemeral equal to true, um, which basically says, Hey, don't store it in the state file. Uh, so it's just a piece of metadata that's attached with, um, your inputs and your outputs that, um, yeah, make it not be stored in state, which is pretty, pretty interesting. 
Um, I was reading a little bit ago, one of my new favorite, like, terraform blogs that i like reading is uh martin atkins who's one of the core maintainers over there he has his own like, yeah he has his own um development mm -hmm. blog where he talks about different features and so um this ephemeral values he kind of talks about the history of some of the some of the issues that they've encountered over the years and like how his perspective on it has changed oh, nice. so yeah pretty it's a pretty good read um you're holding out on me with the good stuff. Well, <laughs> that's my reading list. That's a good one. It's cool because it kind of just shows you the direction of uh, some of the Terraform developments. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that is exciting. Uh, that can maybe help us to close a chapter in Terraform criticism around Terraform state and secrets. Yeah, this article, I think he initially released it right after OpenTofu announced that they were going to be supporting state encryption. And so this was kind of a response saying, hey, we've thought about state encryption and it isn't the answer that we're looking for. We don't believe these values should even exist in state. And so this is kind of like his his thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with both sides of it. Um, I think T Terraform had a, I think Open Tofu had a, another really strong argument for it that wasn't a consideration when um, I think Marty made that uh, first uh, post or announcement. Now, when you say this, I, I, I remember some of that. At the same time, you might recall there was a, a post about uh, some security researcher coming out showing how you can modify the uh if you have access to modify the state file uh you can cause infrastructure to get provision that isn't visible i believe in the plan file and um that that was just evidence that why if you don't do encryption you at least need a cryptographically signed state file for truly understanding if that file was tampered or not again security in depth is just another layer uh if you control the keys to this signing, uh, then you know game's over, anyways. That's interesting. Well, any other? Um... Oh, I didn't see you posted that link so quickly. Any other? Um... Were there any other posts on his development line? Um, they're not very frequent, so a couple of them are a little bit outdated. Oh, uh, here he talks or not about, out. Uh, yeah, stack their concept of it. <laughs> uh, it's just so funny how, yeah, like we didn't invent these terms, but it's uh pretty funny how uh HashiCorp uh basically took them wholesale after we used them this way. Uh, uh, Atmos. All right. Um, any questions we can get answered today? All right. RB, are you on the call today? Not seeing you right away here. Doesn't look like it. So our RB had posted um, a uh, kind of a question in the office hours channel. Uh, which is something interesting. Uh, Michael might be interesting for you too. I don't know if you saw the uh, thread on that as well. I think it was in the contributors. If it was in contributors channel or somewhere else, I can't remember. So um, there is the um, open SSF uh, project, uh, which is establishing kind of transparency in your uh, security uh, practices, if you will. And one of the things it uh, does is it has a scorecard. So you can um, uh, get a scorecard uh, for any uh, repository and see how well it's following some of those best practices. Let me see if I can find the internal. What was that? 
I do remember this thread shortly after seeing it, I went and uh, actually implemented it or like pulled it in and was using it on Terramade. Oh, Um, yeah. yeah, I decided to go and, and give it a try and it absolutely just blew up the repository for uh, the one that stood out was like pinned dependencies. It was Mm -hmm. uh, it was saying that the dependencies weren't pinned very well. And so it hit me with like 35 uh, security things. So after Yeah, see. that, I kind of was disheartened. Yeah. But, well, you weren't pinning, right? It was earned. That's no. true. But uh, yeah, these these things are interesting. And sometimes there are, you know, uh, reasonable um, reasons not to do that pinning. Uh, so, but this is kind of what this uh, report looks like. This is on the Atlantis project. Um, and, you know, it has branch protections, but no signed releases. Um, uh, you know, now with the... Uh, GitHub Actions by GitHub for attestations. It makes it a lot easier to do those uh, signatures. I wonder if this would uh, you know, meet that requirement there, for example. Anyways, this is something we're looking at rolling out uh, at Cloud Posse across, uh, just to showcase kind of all the best practices that we have um, uh, across our organizations and the, some of the precautions that we take. The, uh, the thing I was kind of hoping that there would be would be like a uh, image, um, like a skyscraper banner or image banner that you can kind of use so you can embed this into uh, readmes um, to kind of show off what 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 you're doing. I think they have a badge, but They it do might have just a be a badge. It's generic. very basic. Yeah. Yeah, just a generic. Yeah, they have a. standard github build badge looks like this so it's you know passing your, your score and if you're passing or failing kind of oh yeah do you guys you guys see my screen right i'm not sharing the wrong window there yeah okay cool um yeah so has anyone checked out uh stack lock minder for open source maintenance i've never heard of the project anybody heard of stack lock Is Stacklock the company behind OpenSSF or is OpenSSF truly a foundation? All right. Well, that was that. Um, any other uh, conversations we can have today? Any questions? Uh, so Florian uh, in the chat is asking, uh, this is taking a step uh, back to what Michael was talking about with the uh, Terraform 1.10 alpha about ephemeral values. So this is a good question. I'm going to talk about it more broadly. Um, so Florian uh, asks, you know, so I'm assuming OpenTOFU will be unable to support ephemeral values because of the new Terraform licensing. No, not at all. Uh, so this is the thing, and it's going both ways. Uh, they are not allowed to use the code that is BSL licensed in um, HashiCorp Terraform, but they can re-implement the interface. They can re-implement it conceptually um, without you know, the assistance of looking at that code. So OpenTOFU has a lot of strict uh, processes that they follow uh, so they don't uh, you know, accidentally introduce any uh, proprietary code into that code base. And uh, I bet this is something that uh, Open Tofu is considering. Uh, there's got to be a thread on it somewhere. Uh, everything is very uh, transparent with Open Tofu. If you go to the organization and the discussions, they have uh, RFCs there. There's probably one uh, which is addressing ephemeral values, but I haven't looked. Let's see here. Uh, so Darius, can I have a question? Uh, right. Yeah, Darius, go ahead. Yeah, so I actually have my colleague here as well as human. We work on a project uh, to actually save costs of uh, RDSs in AWS, which are inactive. So as we, we all know if you have a snapshot of a database, like you know the terabytes, uh, AWS charge you for the full size of snapshot, even if it's not if it's half of this uh, only utilized. So we actually. Uh, someone actually creating a 
GitHub action job to uh, make a dump, PG dump to the, the RDS, uh, to S, uh, S3. Just wondering if anyone did something similar or found a way to actually save costs of a databases, which basically inactive for like say weeks or even months uh, and yeah. reasonable size. So then you don't want to keep that snapshot and restore it because then it's still cost a lot. <laughs> Can, can you clarify though, uh, or I miss maybe I misheard. What I thought I heard you say was uh, every snapshot costs the same as what the whole database is, and, which is not my understanding. Uh, it's only you, you pay for the base snapshot and then the incremental differences between snapshots is my understanding of how it was charged. But yes, I yeah, but yeah, yeah, but in our scenario, we just even need one. We don't need incrementals because, like databases, for example down for like two months let's say or three months so we really just need one but because it's like you know let's say 100 terabytes uh, this still 100 terabytes cost a lot of money but because it's text so it's uh, compressed quite well so if we do pg dump and uh, gzip it then uh, we pay tenth of that price and i can see another option to do that kind of saving using native aws tools it looks like a lay they on purpose try to you know sucks money from you <laughs> yeah i mean yeah, there there is that uh but there's also just the the you know i don't know, we struggle with this at cloud posse uh a bunch like you have things that you do when you have to be incredibly cost conscious at the low end um you know you're, you're trying to you know instead of spending a hundred dollars a month for the backups you're trying to spend one dollar a month for the backup <laughs> Right, uh, hundred dollars is a lot depending on your company. But when your yeah. bill on Amazon is a hundred thousand a month, that hundred dollars doesn't even show up. Right, it's a rounding error. Yeah. Um, so the larger your infrastructure, the harder it is. The other thing is the practical realities of that uh, snapshot. Like if it is a hundred terabyte, you know, backup or whatever, uh, that is you know going to take ages to restore from a PG dump. Uh, you're going to have to scale up a database massively to restore any larger type of um, uh, backup that was through PG dump. So uh, they're diminishing kind of returns with it. And that this is where suddenly it becomes a very specific solution. What I mean is it may work for you if you have the X, Y, Z trade-offs and, you know, you, you uh, are accepting uh, of the risks. But if you're not accepting of that, then uh, you better go with uh, the standard AWS uh, snapshots uh, yeah. that permit. I mean, there's so much built into that that you also get as well, the ability to use AWS vaults with that and the ability to do cross-region replication of those and the, the integrations within the UI and you know, all of that you're forsaking when you go the route of using an S3 bucket. But yeah. that's that's my that's just my take. Uh, has anyone experienced with some uh, maybe lambdas or other helpers that uh, facilitate these uh, PG dumps, basically, of a database? The only other uh, you know justification I could see is that it's great if you also want to do cross cloud backup. You want to you know stash one of those over in GCP just in case. Yeah, true. And then they will just still work. And at the moment, how we achieved that is using uh, GitHub Actions, and they have a one hour. So we have a like runner, uh, just simple uh, standard Linux machine. We uh, install PG yeah. dump on it, and then run it. Uh, just the only problem is like one hour limit. So if it's uh, over one hour, then we'll have to think about other running parallel, having faster runner to um, be able to achieve it with an hour. hour. Isn't the one hour limit only if there's no output for one hour? I mean, if there's output, I think it can run longer than an hour. So I'm aware actually it's a one hour hard, hard limit, at least I've seen it. There's no, uh, wasn't, but maybe, but uh, that's what well, but I'm aware now it's one limit. Uh, yeah. yeah. But then uh, there's like, there's a parallel option for the PG dump or, or basically cutting. Kind of, yeah, we try to make still experimenting as I'm asking what. But what our plan is to also have the restore job to at the end run the uh, GitHub action to restore to make sure it fully worked before we delete it from a snapshot. Yeah. Looks like the, it's a six hour limit. All right. Okay. Maybe it's something put on our organization for this uh, one hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people are conscious of their actions <laughs> on GitHub yeah. actions.
because initially we thought to actually spin the Fargate cluster to do that job in the uh, batch mode or something too, then killed it. But yeah. that could be overkill. That's always just going at the mode with GitHub action. Yeah, so, and just that way, uh, like saying for the beer organization, probably you don't worry. And this is like a quite specific case where you don't need database for a couple months. Uh, yeah, I can understand that way. But maybe also a use case scenario where you think may not this database and you want to keep it, but you just want to have it, you know, this uh, very cheap storage, nearly like a tape in old days when in AWS uh, last year. But on a snapshot, you cannot, there's no, no tiering. Mm -hmm. There's export to S3, but uh, we, we try to, rest there is no restore from S3 because when you export to S3, you can only query it with Athena. There's no really. Mm. Way uh, it's one way. <laughs> so when you export to S3, it isn't in a standard like PG dump format. No, it's Parky, Park, Park format. Parky, yeah. Parky, yeah. And there's no restore for that. The only way to you can query with it, Tina, it. but no restore it back. We, at least we couldn't see it. Find it. That's interesting. That makes me wonder. Um... I wonder if people who have experience with Azure or GCP, whether uh, wondering how it looks on the uh, different words, <laughs> whether they are more user friendly in this scenario. Oh, it's the same story. Yes. It is pretty uh, remarkable that they support exporting this way, but not importing. Oh, well. Hmm. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, so someone else was sharing, Mark, uh, I was sharing this link. Uh, let's see here. This is. If you ever, if you never remember the names of AWS uh, API calls, this is helpful. So there, there's a total, this is like the Cartesian product or something. There's 17,000 different types of AWS permissions. I said a second link. You can try that one as a more useful look to it. Interesting. Thank you. For sure. Permissions reference for AWS Classic One. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, that's helpful when you're working on it. So, um, yeah. Mostly for designing policy statements. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have a question if I may. So, yeah, go for so, it. About the liquid base and Aurora in AWS, when anyone had the experience using liquid base for database uh, revisions, but with Aurora. With the moment, use it successfully with standard RDS to basically uh, just either update schemas or just change anything database, but have a problem with Aurora. But, uh, I know it's been okay. it's come up previously on office hours um, as a recommendation or suggestion. Um, I have, I don't recall hearing any negatives with it, um, but it's always one of these questions: uh, at what time uh, does it run in your pipeline? Uh, you know, if you're using Kubernetes, is it an init job? If you're you know using GitHub Actions, should it run before your deployment or after your deployment? What happens if you do a rollback? All those questions. Anyone have uh, experience with Liquibase um, they'd like to share? All right, uh, I saw some, somebody raise their hand or what was? Yeah, uh, it oh. was me. Oh, okay, so sorry, oh. Florian is, okay, Florian oh. is raised. Uh, yeah, well, you go first. Florian asked the earlier question. Go for okay, it. Yeah. So, um, we talked uh, about uh, AWS Copilot, and I saw an alternative before uh, from HashiCorp called uh, Waypoint. Yeah. And uh, did you know about it? And uh, oh I yeah, yeah. I, so, so we talked about before. we talked about Waypoint recently. Actually, it was very interesting because. Uh, Waypoint was, I think, one of the last 
products uh, that graced uh, Hashimoto's hands before he kind of moved into other internal projects and was gearing for gearing up for his departure from HashiCorp. Waypoint was this product that was launched at that time in this very ambiguous manner where it ref they refused to label it anything associated with things that we use today. They wouldn't call it CI, they wouldn't call it CD, they wouldn't call it anything other than like, you know, it's some developer experience platform or tool or something. Well, this is interesting because uh, this came up in the last uh, two weeks or so on office hours. And uh, we, we looked into it at that time. And the HashiCorp uh, uh, platform now has Waypoint as a service as an in, internal developer platform. So they finally decided to label it. Okay, um, you know, internal developer platform. Now I can kind of understand its position, but where it got its roots was very different because uh, HashiCorp uh, started it as an open source project like everything else uh, that they have. And look, it was archived. So uh, they abandoned it as an open source project um, so that's interesting. And they've just made it strictly a commercial one. So what is Waypoint? Well, I don't know what Waypoint is as part of HCP, but what Waypoint was, was honestly something in whatever category you call Dagger, uh, Dagger HQ or Earthly, Waypoint was in that category. Uh, slight, you know, different feature set, but it enabled, uh, you know, a consistent way of describing your build, test, and deploy so that you can uh, abstract that away from your CI and CD system, have it work locally the same way it works remotely, and then just call those commands from your CI. So um, mm -hmm. that that's the extent okay. of my understanding. Uh, did you have a more specific or pointed question on it? Uh, no, but uh, I uh, in my previous job, I used uh, AWS Copilot to... Uh, my task with it was uh, like um, uh, the company was migrating uh, their stack from GCP to AWS. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, I used uh, AWS Copilot to do that. It was uh, yeah, fantastic and uh, it helped me a lot on that. Uh, but I have a little problem with it. Uh, it's like... It doesn't uh, leverage uh, the AWS light sale. Um, we used to have uh, some resources to put it there because uh, we like the model of light sale. But uh, during my research, uh, I found uh, there is a project called FISA. I don't know. I will send you the link. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah I'll send you the link. It's an Arabic word. It's. Uh... Huh. I think the tool is uh, leveraging the light sale. Uh, is doing is doing somehow. It's a, uh, it's a. Uh, I mean, like it's a, uh, a small project, but uh, yeah, it's he's trying to leverage uh, the light sale instead of uh, deploying on ECS or stuff like that. Got it. And, so uh, you try to uh, do that? Are you saying he's basically creating the co-pilot like? experience yes yes yeah uh, and he try he tried to leverage uh, some uh, templates like deploying uh, a ghost uh, platform or uh, deploying uh, an rds ready uh, yeah but uh, i didn't try it i didn't try it but just just uh, so his work and yeah his work is a little bit I mean, old because he's, he's leveraging cloud formation so Okay. This, I mean, yeah, but this project is abandoned. You know, no, no yeah. updates for two years. I wouldn't yeah. even touch it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, were you on the call earlier today when I uh, said uh, talked about um, Copilot briefly and also about uh, ECS uh, CLI tool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you? I saw uh, the did you um, uh, try this uh, ECS CLI before you tried Copilot? Just curious. No, nope, uh, I saw it. I saw it before, uh, but uh, I wasn't uh, yeah, like because um, to be honest, because I was like more inter uh, more interested of migrating the whole stack uh, from database and leveraging secrets and uh, doing a lot of things, and I think this tool doesn't do that. 
doesn't yeah, uh, doesn't have add-ons like Copilot. Um, Copilot has add-ons, so that's uh, make it more interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, that tool is wasn't yeah. <clears throat> okay, that's interesting to position it. Uh, Florian, can we get to your question? Yeah, hey. Um, I kind of very recently noticed something um, in Terraform, which I actually didn't notice before. And I was just kind of wondering if this is kind of an open secret in the Terraform community and that if that was something for me completely new and I kind of completely missed it. But sure. um, I noticed that uh, when I have a look at uh, directly after creating basically fresh resources, AWS resources with Terraform, that there are quite a lot of uh, AWS resources which are having missing fields in the state file. And uh, that's kind of revealed if you run after flash, uh, fresh apply, if you run uh, a, a plan refresh only. And uh, one of the kind of very simple examples is uh, if you start uh, an, an EC2 instance and then assign Elastic IP to it, then basically the AWS instance is completely missing out on that a new public IP is getting assigned. So it's actually having in, if you look in the in the state file, it has the IP address, basically it's old initial IP address it got started with and not the new uh, uh, IP address, which is coming from the Elastic IP. And um, so, Obviously, this is something you can. So I, I looked in dependencies, but even dependencies don't really fix that. And when I started to look into kind of uh, uh, other cases and other modules, so for example, the Cloud Posse VPC module, then this this is also happening with routes, with gateways, and there basically there are fields missing. Um, I found on the GitHub. Um, so in the issue list for the Terraform uh, provider, the AWS provider, I found at least four open bugs, um, and which basically the first one, I guess, has the number 31. So this is actually pretty old. So this is all open. And I found a discussion on the HashiCorp discussion channel, which basically said that this is uh, was originally kind of an, an, a misdesign and it has been never fixed and uh, that this might be fixed with uh, the plugin framework too. Um, but yeah, so I was kind of wondering if other people have noticed this as well and uh, if, if this is kind of an open secret that basically the AWS provider at its current state seems to be broken for these kind of things. I think it's, it might just be, oh, so what I thought you were going to say was slightly different, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, I, I get your point. Uh, and I guess there's a few ways of approaching it or looking at it. There's, uh, there's looking at it from the end user perspective. And then I think I definitely agree with what you're saying. Like these seem to be bugs. And then there's looking at it from the developer perspective and kind of understanding how, you know, the underlying interfaces and what is there. Um, I'm wondering, I, I, I can't attest to this uh, for a fact, but I'm wondering if uh, it's more or less just a reflection of the raw responses from the APIs and looking at our like implementation for the EC2 instance, we handle the case you're talking about, like if an EC2, if an EIP is assigned, then we uh, use that. Otherwise we have the uh, default IP of the, the instance. And my guess is it, you know, they're both right. It's just that one works and one isn't. Uh, one is the one it was established with versus one is the current one. Um, and you can, uh, you know, reattach. You can have more than one EIP. Um, can Yeah, you can have multiple EIPs, no, per instance, or am I totally wrong? You can, I think, yeah, so you should be able yeah. to attach, I think it's up to 15, 16 yeah. um, network interfaces, and then you can have yeah. different EIPs. But the thing I was surprised of is that the state file itself is reporting that it had, so it's wrong. But, but, but if it's a one-to-many relationship, I mean, how can it report 
the IP if you can have multiple IPs. It's really you got no, no. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. It's just simply that the EC2 instance comes first up. Uh, technically, so first comes up with uh, with another uh, public IP because the yeah. the subnet automatically assigns a new IP address to it. And then when you just do the association with the Elastic IP, then this is changing. Yeah. But there are also there are other uh, examples too, and this is the one I kind of really went through step by step by um, basically downloading the state file before and after doing a, uh, an apply refresh only, and you can re actually see that there are a couple of fields are changing, and they are simply it it kind of seems that uh, the AWS provider never really does a refresh at the end. So it's basically, it doesn't wait till the state on AWS is completely settled. And then it doesn't reread the, the state and writes the correct state down. It basically has an intermediate state, uh, which then gets written down. And then when you do a refresh only, then at this point, you notice that the, that, uh, the state in the cloud actually is different to the one which is huh. in the file. So, so you're saying basically there's there is basically always drift after the first apply of a resource with an EIP. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I have actually, I have a minimal example because I couldn't believe that <laughs> uh, this is consistent, but even with the okay. latest AWS provider, I have this as a consistent problem. And if you actually do the standard Cloud Posse VPC uh, module, you will yeah. actually notice that it's not only the ERPs, it's also the the, the routes and the the, uh, the gateways. There are also fields which are, they're even completely um, uh, well, then, fields which are missing. Okay, because I was going to say the NAT gateways, we assign an EIP, so that would explain mm -hmm. that the problem yeah. extends to the NAT gateways. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, and... And like I said, there are there right now there are about four bugs which are currently or four issues which are created for the Terraform AWS. Uh, actually, it's three, and they are all open. Hmm. <laughs> well, hmm. I yeah, I uh, don't have anyone have something to add to this one. Um, open bugs that aren't fixed is uh, not too uncommon with HashiCorp for Terraform. There's, I mean, like with the, it, well, and also to, to be fair, uh, I believe AWS has taken over a lot of the maintenance of that provider. Is, is by the way, anybody aware of uh, what was mentioned as the plugin framework two, what that is? Because that was mentioned that might basically then help with fixing those issues. Or do you mean like the AWS CC? Uh, provider? I, I don't really know. So the, um, let me actually send you the link where this is mentioned. So it would be interesting if you did try the AWS CC provider, which is the next gen provider. It still has, you know, its adoption pales in comparison to the AWS provider. But if you're writing your own modules and components, I suppose that's fine. Uh, like, the AWS CC provider has a total of 11 million downloads, and that's probably what you see the AWS provider does per day or something. <laughs> Let's see. I'm curious. What does the AWS provider do? So 11 million for CC. And 33 million per week <laughs> on the AWS provider. So, yeah, there you have that. All right. Uh, well, we are basically at time for today. Uh, we have time for, you know, maybe very quick question. Otherwise, maybe I'll wrap things up. Any uh, quick questions? Oh, just I posted an interesting link about um, analyzing and capturing noisy neighbor using eBPF. You posted that in the uh, office hours Slack or? In the chat, in the chat here locally. Uh, I think you might have messaged read.ai, the annoying bot that messages you first. So you message it. Says meeting group chat. Yeah. I, 
Where did you? Oh, was it higher up? Joaquin? No, he's. Oh, sorry. I thought you post, posted it recently. Um, that was earlier in the call today. Yes. Yeah, so yeah there's other discussions. I didn't want to interrupt it. Oh, oh, okay. Noisy neighbor detection with EVDF. So they wrote a tool and they talk about the technique. And so they, they have hooks into like sketch wake ups, uh, sketch wake up new and sketch switch to track the progress of wake time hmm. uh, in a scheduling um, queue and determine the run queue latency. Hmm. And then they employed additional tools like EPFPF ring buffers to for efficient data transmission. And just read a summary of this. Um, so, and then they uh, also have another tool. I, I forgot the name of the tool, but uh, basically it rides on top of EPPF to add some like observability so that you could detect the noisy neighbor. Mm -hmm. And for anyone that's had like a multi-tenancy with containers sucking all the resources, things like that, this is this is like nice. But it seems yeah. kind of advanced. I haven't gotten to this level of <laughs> profiling, tracing. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. This, uh, way to go if people build high level tools on top of this that make it easier for the rest of us um mere mortals <laughs> yeah that that's what this feels like and i feel uh i feel stupid looking at this boy yeah yeah and he, well you've seen brandon craig i don't know if you've seen him talk before uh, no he wrote that profiling book from addison wisely or whatever and uh yeah, they go deep. They have flame graphs, and it just—it's really amazing. There's like a whole profiling world. Um, but uh, yeah, something I'd like to get into more. And then also, you probably—I don't know if you came across um, continuous profiling. Uh, no, I haven't seen that one. So you know the observability. You have the different types of observability. You have the metrics. You have the logs. You have the tracing. So now there's another fourth one, which is continuous profiling and uh I'll feel continuously <laughs> inadequate continuous so inadequate. later next time but like grafana has a whole product offering they actually acquired a company that was doing that and they had their own so they're merging their own tool with this company they acquired uh making a whole new fourth spoke of uh, observability that is that is interesting puts a new spin on ci yeah all right. Well, we are at time for today. Let me uh, pause things here and we'll pick things up again next week at the same time, same place. Uh, we'll be posting a recording of this session to our Office Hours channel. Just go to youtube.com slash cloud posse. And in a few hours, you'll see the video posted there. Uh, if you're curious about uh, you know leveling up your uh, game at your organization with AWS and Terraform, uh, we're here to help you out with that. Go to cloudposse.com slash meet. Again, cloudposse.com slash meet. Answer a few quick questions and book a call with me directly, and we'll talk through your situation and see how we can help you out based on what we do here at Cloud Posse. So uh, here are some uh, next steps that you can take if you're just getting started with our community and what we have going on here at Cloud Posse. Uh, if you haven't joined our Slack community, go to slack.cloudposse.com to uh, register. Uh, we have a great community there with uh, very active channels and Terraform, Atmos, and uh, others. We also have our newsletter, which is a, all, which is a weekly newsletter and has all the links uh, that we shared today. Uh, those go out in that newsletter on a weekly basis. Go to newsletter.cloudposse.com to register for that. Our podcast is a syndication of this Office Hours in audio format. So if you want to catch up and back episodes of Office Hours on the train, just go to podcast.cloudposse.com. So with that said, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your week and talk to you next week. Thank you. Bye.